Right, hey guys, how are we doing? Back with another video from Annie News, continuing with the Overlord Cut content. What episode are we on? Episode 5, is it? Episode 5 of Season 4. Let's just get straight into it. Loving Overlord so much, and it's really cool to see. I say this every week. What has been missed out and changed? It's rather ironic that the very thing Ayn seeks the most is also what he happens to worry about the mm. most. As a person who prefers to be prepared for pretty much everything, it's his fellow Idrisol players that bring with them the most uncertainty. Yeah. Sure, finding one would be rather ideal, but it's when he finally does that the circumstances need to be right. Whether he's met with open arms... Are they gonna be an enemy? I can't wait to see what happens if he does find one. That's the reason he's heading to the Dwarven Kingdom now. What the anime has left out, though, is a massive prologue setting all this up. Oh. Crucial details regarding the runes, the dwarves, and this whole expedition cool. that really help you understand why it's so important. So, just like how we did before, let's take a look at what the anime missed from the novels. Cool. Let's get started. Episode 44, Part 1. In Pursuit of the Land of Dwarves. Covering a brief epilogue from Volume 10, as well as Chapters 1 and 2 from Volume 11. Okay. This whole scene we see between Albedo and Demiurge was the final wrap-up to the Ruler of Conspiracy arc. It was mainly to clue us in as to what's been going on elsewhere, as well as show us a few reactions. I love that there's, like, stuff going on all over the place with different people. So, with Demiurge having reached the final stages of his plans for the Sacred Kingdom, cool. he was here now seeking approval for the use of a doppelganger. Whatever he was planning to do to finish his mission over there, it clearly required the talents of a shapeshifter. Mm -hmm. But when Albedo went on to tell them that Ainz wasn't here, the emotion with which she said it was rather different from how she usually was. Sure, she definitely had the same look like how she usually did, but even Demiurge, with his all-seeing observant eyes, was still incapable of pinpointing what she was hiding. Mm. She was actually the only person alongside Ainz who he couldn't read properly. That being the case, it was a little bit frustrating to not be able to do so, but when reminded that her being an exception was actually a good thing, looking past it was significantly easier. Now, with Ainz gone and no one else around, Demiurge then inquired as to where the other four guardians were. Well, with Shaltir and Aura out with Ainz, Kaki oh, well, just, is just making notes every time he asks her to do something now. Then Mari was building a dungeon on the outskirts of Arantel. Not much else was said otherwise, but no one was slacking when it came to putting in work for Nazareth. Yeah, everyone's doing something. When Almedo posed her question to Demiurge next, Demiurge had actually gone to mention the three things he needed to subdue the Empire. And it's like, the first was having Ainz make a move himself. The second was about a month's worth of time, then the third was a ride in a major city of oh. the Empire. Those were the core components behind how he would have done it. But... <laughs> Since having Ainz act on his behalf was out of the question, though, Demiurge always thought it was simpler to just conquer the kingdom first. That way their ability to pressure the Empire would be significantly easier. He but is breaking it, isn't he? <laughs> that Ainz had done it in three days, the emotions he felt were a jumble of rapture, envy, awe, and respect. It was an indescribable passion that reassured Demiurge of just how intelligent Ainz was. Much to the point that he was starting to become jealous of Pandora's actor for it. Regardless, if there was one thing that Demiurge knew for certain now, it was that there truly was no way him or anyone else could come even close to their master's intellect. What makes this thought so particularly funny though is the context that comes after when Ainz is thinking to himself about what just happened here. He was extremely confused and anxious over Jerknev suddenly wanting to become a vassal state. So much so that he just wanted to go far away and leave it to Demiurge and Albert. <laughs> Let them slow so, down. while thinking of ways to avoid the hassle of all these politics, Ainz remembered the runes he saw at Osk's place. An important thought he felt could potentially lead him to another player. Hmm. Reason being that, amongst all the questions he had about their existence in the New World, Seems the most so. important was the implications of what a runecrafter class could mean for him. Since Yggdrasil didn't have a class called Runecraft, that meant this class was specific to the New World. Right. The thing is, if the writing they used for runes was something unique to Yggdrasil, then that meant someone must have taught them it. Yeah. 100 years ago, during the peak of Runecraft, it's very possible an Yggdrasil player could have taught the dwarves this craft and created a fusion of techniques that blended ones from both worlds. So, out of the hopes of finding... Right, so that's why he's like, right, we need to, to go down it. this route. The only problem was that if there was in fact a player behind these runes, then the possibility of it being the one who brainwashed Shaltir needed to be considered. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. So, it was too risky to send anyone other than himself, since he knew best how to deal with players. Of course, going alone would be just as foolish as well, so Ainz began to consider which bodyguards would be best to bring with him. And because all he needed was brute force to buy time for a retreat, the best candidates were obviously any of the level 104 guards. Yeah. 
The thought of using them as shields did make him feel a bit emotional, but when he remembered how resurrection was always an option, Eins began to think it was a bit more reasonable. What made him truly accept this plan, though, was the opinion of the maid who was watching him. Oh, right. You see, while unsure as to whether to use the guardians or not, Eins had asked the maid if she was willing to die for him. When the maid didn't hesitate to say yes, Eins then asked if all the others would as well. And it was the maid's response to this that would ensure Eins it was okay to mobilize the NPCs. You see, while yes, they were his friend's precious creations, at the end of the day they were created to serve him. Yeah. What Eins was always forgetting to consider was that following his orders was the most fulfilling thing that any of them could do for him. So, with no more doubts on what Yeah, giving them stuff to do Eins is like what they the want. It's like, yes, come on, we can prove ourselves. Then formulate a plan on how to approach the dwarf king bringing us to a massive section the anime had left out in order to get to the main stuff faster. Before we get to that, though, it was at the beginning of Volume 11 where a prologue detailing the dwarves was given to us. Oh, okay, cool. It's not extremely crucial to the plot, but it does develop Gondo while setting up his presence in Bayo Rido, the abandoned city we find him in later on in the episode. Initially, he was just doing a normal day's work mining heat stones in their new city, but it was this day in particular that was rather special. You see... Gondo had just finished saving up to buy the equipment he needed for a journey. Despite everyone's warnings not to, he was heading off to the abandoned city to mine for white iron. Sure, he could just try to mine for it here as a worker of the state, but the bonus he would make for that was marginal in comparison to if he was to mine for it himself. Right. If he went to Bay Rido, though, that meant that he could mine, keep, and sell whatever ore that he wanted. There wouldn't be anyone telling him to give his work to the state, and everything he did... I love how in the recent episode, Ayn was talking to him, and he was like, I might just happen to look away when you find the uh, <laughs> treasure that you're looking for. He didn't really specify what that was, but the core motivation behind it was to rediscover lost technology. He was setting out on this risky journey in hopes of continuing his father's research, a lofty endeavor which required both money and white iron. Any white iron would be used directly with the research, and everything else would be sold to assist with that. Cool. It was the least Gondo felt he could do to live up to the magnificent man that was his father. You could even say it was his very reason for living. Switching back to the main story now, and there was a whole bunch of scenes left out regarding Heinz's preparations for the dwarf oh, right, Okay. It's a bit too long to go into extreme detail, and so instead I'll just summarize a lot of the main aspects. First, Heinz was given a brand new outfit in preparation for a meeting with the lizard man. This wasn't the oh. same meeting from the anime, but instead a one on one with the former Razor Tail chieftain Kyuku. Oh. It was a meeting Kyuku had set up to give an update on the status of the lizard man village. The update itself was just a lengthy handwritten letter. It was funny, Kyuku is trying to be the best chair. <laughs> giving Heinz the opportunity to ask him a few questions after the fact. So, after talking about Saryusu, his wife, and his newborn child, Heinz then went on to inquire about the dwarves. A question that would lead to an answer he never would have expected. You see, when Heinz had heard that the dwarves liked to mine a rare metal on par with adamantite and orichalcum, he couldn't help but hope that it would be prismatic ore. The reason why this is is because prismatic ore was the key to making a world item. Hmm. The caloric stone which his guild had accidentally come across after monopolizing the ore from a celestial uranium mine. By placing this valuable mineral altogether in a vault in Nazarick, the result was a natural reaction which went to form this powerful world item. Cool. It was one that his guild would have liked to farm to have more of, but before that could happen, another guild had stolen the mine from them. Bastards. They had used their own world item to lock Einzel going out of it. So, if this rare dwarven metal was the prismatic ore from Yggdrasil, oh. then Einz could potentially start to farm this world item. If not, at the very least he could get information on what other ores were out there, making his trip to the dwarven kingdom even more important than it was before. Part of the reason why these unknown materials were so important was because more than once Einz had come across items that were impossible to make in Aegisum. Weapons like Gossip's sword mm. and Zardius's frost pain were all pieces of equipment whose origin was unknown to him. Perhaps if he learned more about how this world's crafting worked though, then items like that would no longer be a mystery to him. Mm -hmm. Not only would he not be caught off guard by weapons he couldn't prepare for, but he could also manufacture them to make his arsenal yeah, even stronger. Go. Yet another facet to Nazareth that would improve its overall influence. So, if Eins could somehow get some dwarves to join his nation, then he would pretty much have every aspect of craftsmanship covered by someone. The librarian was making scrolls with Demiurge's materials. Cool. Neferia was handling potions. Fluter was in There's so much stuff going on. Then the dwarves would be tasked with equipment crafting. It was a good start to advancing Nazareth towards the future. 
What Ainz was really concerned about, though, was the 600-year head start the six gods had in front of him. You see, if these six gods truly were players from Yggdrasil, then it was very likely they could have taken the same measures that Ainz had. If a person as average as Suzuki Setu could, then Ainz thought for sure that any player could. So, in the off chance that this was in fact true, Ainz knew he had to be careful of impeding on another player's research. Mm. The dwarves could very well be crafting items for another player already making this journey far more dangerous than he thought before. That being the case, Ainz would bring along more than just Shaltir and Oro, but initiate the meeting as a diplomatic one at first. Ideally, he would have liked to handle the situation similar to how he did with Isaac. If a player did attack and prove to be trouble, though, then Ainz and his army would have a justifiable cause to retaliate, yeah, and retreating they have reason. knowledge wanted would simply be a matter of pulling it from the rubble after. As for what that knowledge was, well, the main priorities were as follows. First was the presence of any player. Next, the investigation of the runes and their origins. Then, finally, the attainment of dwarven smithing technology and their knowledge. Those were the key things Ainz was hoping to discover here. There was a bit more to Ainz's thoughts, but that's pretty much the essence of what he was prepping for. He did hear from Kyuku that a lizard man had more information, but that wasn't something he'd act on until a little bit later. Right, okay. Instead of what came first was the additional scouting information from Isaac and Fluter, then a meeting with Aura and Shelter. God, there's so much that they've left out. <laughs> Since neither Isaac Bloody nor Fluter knew much about the dwarves, that left the only remaining lead as Zenvidu, the lizard man we saw Ainz talking to in the anime. Right. Before we get to that, though, Ainz first had to go about informing Shelter of her new responsibilities. Since all she'd been doing was opening gates for the denizens of Nazarick, there all was she'd an been important doing. handoff that needed to be done so that Mari need to take more over. responsibility, Shaltir, around here. Ever since Shaltir had become mind-controlled by the enemy, she'd been restricted to surveillance duties within the confines of Nazarick. So, when I had told her she'd finally be part of something major again, she was ecstatic to be presented with the opportunity I to be to prove herself. First things first, though. Mari needed to receive the ring of Ainzul Gon, as well as be thoroughly briefed on what his responsibilities were. So, until that task was done, Ainz would wait in Arantel while briefing Orma. Now, a quick thing to note about the ring being left behind is that it was very important to Ainz none of them ever leave the insides of Nazarick. Reason being that the threat it posed from being stolen was simply far too great. God, yeah, can you imagine? That's why the only person allowed to carry a ring outside was Ainz as a precaution just in case the entrance to Nazarek got blocked off somehow. Should that happen and no one else possess a ring, then Nazarek would forever be locked out to anyone outside of it. So, aside from that and the ones the floor guardians were permitted to carry within Nazarek, all the others were hidden within the pile of gold in the treasure room, oh, cool. making it very difficult for invaders to ever... Extremely. Get Jesus, look at that gold. <laughs> That's a lot to look for. Discussion with Aura now, it was here that he explained why he had chosen Shaltir for this mission. You see, because Shaltir knew she was one of the strongest in Nazarek, that mindset had led her to limit the way she thought about battle. Rather than approach things with strategy like how Ainz does, she instead chooses to do so with force. Thus, the reason she had lost to Ainz in Season 1. Mate, the way she was Ainz fighting those um, that if things that were invading the Dwarf Kingdom in the episode no after this. Ever been able to beat <sighs> she brutal. More specifically, had she started with an Hidiar, then prepped as many spells as possible, the combined barrage with the follow-up of Blood Frenzy and CQC with the Pipe at Lance would have easily overwhelmed Ainz to the point of retreat. Damn. So, that lack of strategy and the suboptimal gear limiting her overall power were the only things preventing Shaltir from being one of the best at PvP. That being the case, in addition to Ainz using this mission to stimulate Shaltir's growth, he would also have Aura watch over her to guide her along a bit, allowing for a more streamlined method of granting her experience. It was a standard training policy Ainz had read from a business book after being transported here. Ah, right. Now, once all was said and done, the entire team chosen for the mission from Nazarek was six vampire brides and 25 undead from Shaltir's family, five Hanzos Ainz had recently seen, that cool. then 30 death knights and several of Aura's magical beasts. God, the death knights this are insane as well. Which Ainz would set out to go see Cockutis with, finally bringing us to the start of the episode. Whoa! It was that was a lot. That was cut out. Oh, Jesus it was Christ. Time <laughs> to give Cockutis a reward. You see, with Albedo and Mari having rings of Ainz Ulgon, Aura a watch featuring the voice of Buka Buka Chagawa, Shaltir the Encyclopedia, <laughs> <of Uru> <laughs> then Demiurge the demon statue that Ulbert made, that left Kakutis as one of the few loyal guardians left to not have received a reward from him. Aww. That being the case, Ainz insisted Kakutis request something from him, something more than just a desire to serve him. 
Since Cocutus couldn't come up with something immediately, though, I'd would give him a week to choose what he wants. Cool. A gift I hope we'll see sometime later in the end. That'd be cool. Now, when I started talking to Zen Budden next, an important bit of discussion worth pointing out was the extremely bold attitude he had taken with regards to the dwarves topic. Because they had once helped him out in the past, Zen Budden had said that if Ainz was going to end up being hostile to them, he wouldn't hesitate to join them and fight against him. Ah, it was an act he didn't quite say that in the anime, did he? No, he did mention that he didn't want any hostility towards them. What Ainz had done to take care of it himself, though, was warn Zenbudu of the consequences of him doing so. You see, Zenbudu may have thought that his rebellion wouldn't be consequential to anyone else, but Ainz made sure to tell him that it very well could be. Mm -hmm. Should Zenbudu Jesus. choose to go against Nazarick, then the possibility of Ainz annihilating the entire village wasn't completely out of the question. Wow. Like, if Zenbudu's little act would encourage others to do the same, then wiping them out would be the only option remaining to him. Of course, Ainz wasn't actually going to do that, but this heavy-handed warning was certainly enough to discourage Zenbudu from doing anything rash. Now, fighting the dwarves was just as unlikely as well, but Ainz knew he still needed to be cautious of other players. You see, the whole reason he wanted to establish friendly relations was mainly so he could demonstrate just how diplomatic his sorcerer kingdom could be. If he went to war with the dwarves while making the Empire his vassal, then any other player in the world would quickly come to see him as a force of evil. Mm -hmm. If he made allies instead, though, his sorcerer kingdom wouldn't be seen as such a hostile place anymore. It could even become this hub where players might go to team up with him. So, the major issue this type of relationship avoided was the establishment of player teams who would want to fight against him. Like, in the worst case scenario where the sorcerer kingdom became perceived as this nation of evil, it would only be natural for other players to team up and try to defeat it. And that was one of the few things that Ainz truly feared within this new world. What scared him wasn't an individual player or even a hostile nation, but instead a group of skilled players teaming up against him. Right, yeah. That, that would be something, with a Jesus. Item, or a player with a class like World Champion Oof. were the only things Ainz wasn't sure Nazarick could defend against. But yeah, that's pretty much it for everything prior to the journey. There was a bit more to be said about Zardyusu and his family, but that pertained more to the perspective of another race coming to live with humans. Right. Long story short, the anxiety that would come from being in a whole different country wasn't something Zardyusu or his family thought they would want to go through. In any case, with that covering about the first third of the episode, the next will cover the rest and perhaps even some of the next. It all depends on how much was cut. It does seem like they're increasing their pacing a bit, but I do believe they're capturing a majority of the story. Overall, it's been pretty coherent so far. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time. Ciao. Ciao. Crazy. That was a lot. <laughs> that was a lot. As soon as he goes, and then we're up to the anime. It's like, we've nearly got through this whole episode, this video. <laughs> I am liking these cut content ones. So we've got another one that's going to be covering the same episode. Jesus Christ, that's insane. And he did a video on Albedo, but I checked it out. And it's literally like the How Strong and Who Is videos all compiled into one video. So I didn't want to watch something I've already seen, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, that was cool. Definitely check the next one out. And thank you to my patron. If you want to have your name at the end of every video I upload, link is in the description to the Patreon page. One dollar a month is all I ask to help support the channel. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you guys very much for that. And a special thank you to Snidely Whiplash, who is currently donating $50 a month to the Patreon page as well. And thank you all for watching. What do you guys think of that? What do you guys think of this? Click like, subscribe, and leave comments down below. Let me know what I should watch and discuss in future videos. And I'll see you guys, all you guys, next time.